Hare Krishna devotees, please accept my humble obeisance as August Shishir Prabhupada. Welcome devotees to today's morning class. Today we will be discussing from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 2, Chapter 1, Verse 26. And the chapter is entitled, The First Step to God Realization. And we are in the discussion of the Virat Rup. Very interesting, deep, technical discussion. And we're very happy to have His Holiness Chandra Mali Swami with us. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to you and Shri Prabhupada Maharaj. <clears throat> My basis is to you and all the devotees. Hare Krishna. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 2, Chapter 1, Text 26. Patalam mitasya hi padamulam, patanti parsni pradadeva satalam, mahatalam vishvas rijota gulpau zatalatalam va purushasya jange. Persons who have realized it have studied that the planets known as Patala constitute the bottoms of the face of feet of the Lord, the universal Lord, and the heels and the toes are the Rasatala planets, the ankles are the Mahatala planets, and the shanks constitute the Talatala planets. <laughs> Purport. Outside the bodily existence of the Supreme Personality Godhead, the manifested cosmic existence has no reality. Everything and anything of the manifested world rests on him, as confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita 9.4. But that does not imply that everything and everything, anything in the vision of the materialist is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Conception of the universal form of the Lord gives a chance to the materialist to think of the Supreme Lord, but the materialist must know for certain that his visualization of the world in a spirit of lording over is not God realization. The materialistic view of exploitation of the material resources is occasioned by the illusion of the external energy of the Lord. And as such, if anyone wants to realize the supreme truth by conceiving of the universal form of the Lord, he must cultivate the service attitude. Unless the service attitude is revived, the conception of Virat realization will have very little effect on the seer. The transcendental Lord, and in any conception of his form, is never part of the material creation. He keeps his identity as a supreme spirit in all circumstances, never affected by the three qualities, for everything is contaminated. Everything material is contaminated. The Lord always exists by his internal energy. The universe is divided into 14 planetary systems. Seven planetary systems called Bhur, Bhuva, Swar, Mahar, Janas, Tapas, and Satya are upward planetary systems, one above the other. There are also seven planetary systems downward known as Atala, Vitala, Sutala, Talatala, Mahatala, Rasatala, and Patala, gradually one below the other. In this verse, the description begins from the bottom because it is in the line of devotion that the Lord's bodily description should begin from his feet. Sukadeva Goswami is a recognized devotee of the Lord, and he is exactly correct in the description. Omigyan timirandasya gena jana salakaya bhak chaksun militam yenatas my shri guruvena maha maun vishnu padaya krishna prastaya bhutale shri makti bhakti vedanta swami iti namine namaste saraswati deve gaudavani pracharine nirvasesa sunyavadi pasyatya de satarine panchakalpa thirubhischa Ripa Sindhu, Pe Bacha Patitanam Pavane Bio, Vaishnave Bio, Namaho Namaha, 
Shri Krishna, Chaitanya Prabhu, Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadahar, Srivasani Gaur, Bhaktarina, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hmm. So for the this chapter is called The First Step in God Realization. And this one is uh, described in a very, what we say, unusual way that all of the planetary systems together make up the body of the Lord because everything rests on the Lord. And we can say that the different parts of the planetary arrangements are the different body on the transcendental body of the Lord. But this is an imaginary form. It has no reality in existence. It's something that is implanted on the mind in order for the non-devotees, the materialists, to get an understanding that God is within his creation. But actually God is both within the creation and outside of the creation. That's mentioned in this verse from Bhagavad Gita. Maya itam ditam tarjam bhavyakta mortina. Vatstani sarvabhutani nateshu vavyastita. Krishna says that yeah, by my by my unmanifested form, I pervade and support this whole universe. Everything is within me, but I am not within them. <clears throat> so at the same time, he's within and without. And for the materialists who have no conception or do not engage in devotional service to the Lord, this imaginary form gives them a chance to understand that everything in creation is, in one sense, the Lord. But at the same time, it's not the Lord. <laughs> this is the principle of Achintya Beta Beta Tapfa. It's one with and not different. His energies are not different than him, but his energies are not him at the same time. It's like the rays of the sun are not the sun, but at the same time, they are the sun. The rays can never be separated from the sun, but if you say the sun and the rays are the same, then you make the mistake of uh, what we say monism, applying everything in the one sense with no differentiation. Therefore, no variety. Without variety, one cannot understand the absolute truth because the absolute truth manifests himself in varieties of himself through his different energies. So here it's mentioned that there are 14 planetary systems, seven up and seven down. The earth planet is also mentioned within that seven description as the one of the seven upper planetary system. It's the lowest of the upper planetary system. There's Bur, Bhuva, and Swa. Swa is the heavenly planets. Bur, Bhuva are um, the higher planet. Uh, Bor and Bhuva, Bhuva Loka is the earthly planet. That is called the middle planets. Although they, they give the description of seven up and seven down, there is also a military planetary system where the earth planet exists. And so just for the sake of description, it's, go, it's given up and down. So uh, the materialists will want to see the Lord through the material energy. They don't want to worship the Lord, but they can't see the Lord through the material energy. So it says this, this imprint upon the mind is an imaginary form where at least they can get an understanding that things are not separate from the Lord. It's, it's, it's something called pantheism, but in, in another way it is not because pantheism says that everything is the Lord. But here it says that everything is is the Lord and at the same time not the Lord. That Srila Prabhupada's purport gives a clear and correct understanding how this achinta beta beta tattva, achinta means inconceivable, how something could be one and different at the same time and still exist. <laughs> so here we have the different uh, planetary systems. And Sukadeva Goswami is going to start a description of the universal form, and he starts with the lower planetary system, Spatala Loka, is considered to be non-different than the bottom of the feet of the universal form. As you rise up to the, the, the higher stages, the different planetary systems correlate with different parts of the universal body as they go all the way up to Satya Loka, which is the head of the Lord, or the top of the head of the Lord. 
And in within the planetary systems, there is different descriptions of the ingredients that make up the planetary systems, such as rivers, mountains, and forests. And all of these are also analogous to different parts of the transcendental body of the Lord in his Virat Rup. For instance, the says the mountains are his bones, the uh, the trees are his hairs on his body. So this is not for the Vaishnavas. The Vaishnavas worship the Lord and his supreme personality of Godhead as Sri Krishna, whose transcendental form is eternal and not imaginary. Um, but for the non-devotees, but it also mentions here that unless the non-devotees have a service attitude, Instead of an exploitative attitude, they can't even take benefit from the universal description because the explo exploitative attitude puts one not in the right position for understanding. In other words, rather than seeing the Lord, one tries to exploit the energy of the Lord and thinks that the energy of the Lord is meant for Explo exploitation for one's own sense gratification. And that mentality is the, what, what causes the conditioned souls to become, a, become conditioned. Conditioned means that they are not in their constitutional position as pure spiritual beings, but they're conditioned by these en this energy called material energy, which is made up of three types of conditioning, goodness, passion, and ignorance. Ignorance is the lowest, and as we go along the transcendental body of the Lord, you see that the lower planetary systems are more or less connected with the mode of ignorance. As you go higher up to the body, you get to the middle and then to the higher. So in the same way, the universal body of the Lord is also divided into three categories according to the karma that is present within each of the planetary systems. So therefore, uh, for the human beings on the middle planetary systems, Uva Loka, that is the Earth planet, and some planets that are around the Earth planet, this is called the middle planetary systems. And in the middle planetary systems, there is a balance, or it's supposed to be, a balance between suffering and, and material happiness. Material suffering and material happiness are somewhat balanced in the middle. So in this middle tip planetary systems, there's great opportunity to reach the transcendental level. Whereas in the higher planets and in the lower planets, one is at a disadvantage to reach the higher the higher planet, the higher realization of God as the supreme personality of Godhead. Why is that? Because in the lower planetary systems, there is more suffering. And because people suffer much, they, they cannot take to devotional service of the Lord. They're always trying to counteract their suffering in different ways. You see that even on this planet. When a person doesn't have food, clothing, or proper arrangements in their material life, for them to take the devotional service becomes very difficult. They may do it at a sentiment, but they're still their desire is to somehow or other free themselves from the suffering that is imposed upon them due to their activities in the material world. The point is they never they never change their activities and they expect that their the suffering will automatically decrease simply by rearranging the material activities in such a way that the exploitation that they engage in is similar but different. <laughs> if you want to exploit something in one way and then you can't exploit it in that way, you try another way to exploit it. And therefore, the three modes, at least the modes of uh, the two modes, the modes of passion and ignorance, are, for, are forms of exploitation of the material energy. Exploitation, the word actually means to take advantage of something for one's own personal interest. So we see exploitation comes in the form of people, uh, or even the earth planet itself. And that exploitation causes the living entity to get entangled in a cycle of reaction and reaction, which they cannot get out unless they take to devotional service to the Lord. And gradually they can free themselves from that. So the suffering on the lower planetary system is, is greater. And as you go up to the higher 
higher planetary systems, gradually the suffering becomes less and less and less. In the higher planets, there is hardly any material suffering, and it's mostly what we call material happiness. Material happiness is also a misnomer because in material happiness is not actually happiness. It's just in a higher form of existence that is a little less suffering because as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Abrahma Bhuvana Loka Purna Mitta Arjuna, that from the highest planet to the lowest planet in the material cosmos existence, all are places of misery. He doesn't give credit even to the higher planets. He calls them miserable also. Why? Because repeated birth and death take place. So as long as one is still under the concept under the influence of the three modes of material nature, even the mode of goodness, they're still engaged in the various types of suffering, which cause them to get old, die, take take birth again in one form or another, somewhere in the material cosmic arrangement. But the whole thing is all, all there to purify the living entity from their desire to enjoy in the material world. The material world has two functions, to elevate the conditioned souls away from the desire to exploit material energy and to engage them in devotional service, and also to facilitate those who want to exploit the material energy by giving them the intelligence by which they can lord it over the material energy. So by by through the process of suffering, many some decide no longer to engage in these activities, and Krishna says they come to devotional service. If they come to devotional service, and they come, even if they come for the wrong reason, some people come because of material suffering, others come because they want to gain more material happiness, uh, others come because it becomes a feature of interest where they want to understand what is spiritual life and how I can benefit from it, and those others who have some knowledge of spiritual life take it up for the benefit of self-realization. Krishna calls all four of these people mahatmas, and that means great souls, uh, because they are acting in a way that brings them out of the material energy. Unfortunately, many people, many persons, or let me, many conditioned souls who come to devotional service for the first two, that is to increase their material happiness or to get rid of their material suffering, they again go back to material life after getting relief from material suffering or getting some benefit from devotional service. And then they leave and they go back again. But those who understand, therefore, to understand what is the uh, goal of devotional service what is the process of devotional service? It means to engage in service of the Lord for the pleasure of the Lord. When one engages in devotional service for the pleasure of the Lord, then the, the material energy works to elevate that person towards that consciousness where they can free themselves from the attachment of the material world and at the same time make progress in self-realization, where they develop the qualities of devotion, as mentioned in the Srimad Bhagavatam and in other aspects of religious Vedic scriptures. So one uh, here, it's interesting, it's imaginary, and it's very uh, instructive at the same time, that for this shows that Bhagavatam is also concerned with the non-devotees. Although they may not take up devotional service directly, he, they, Bhagavatam gives them a chance to get a foothold towards devotional service by, re, by describing the whole material creation in terms of the transcendental body of the Lord in an analogous way so the, the conditioned souls can understand that everything within the creation, in one sense, is the Lord. But at the same time, for the for the uh, for the transcendentalists, it is not the Lord. At the same time, so it's interesting here. So, Srimad Bhagavatam, especially Second Canto, is a very uh, uh, important 
part of the Bhagavatam because it sets the foundation for the rest of the Bhagavatam. And it describes the whole process of devotional service in different stages, all the way up to pure devotional service as you get into the later chapters in the second canto. Second canto is really a glorification of Srimad Bhagavatam and its different features and how Srimad Bhagavatam uh, elevates one from one stage of devotional service to another, a higher stage, and ultimately to the stage of pure devotional service as it moves through the cantos and ultimately culminates in the 10th canto with which was the topmost aspect of devotional service, where one starts to understand their eternal relationship with the Lord in loving devotional service in the mood of Sri Vrindavandav. That means in the mood of, of intimacy with the Lord in different relationships. So make a study of the Srimad Bhagavatam. If you do, your life will become really interesting and very much beneficial. And uh, you'll find that there is an unlimited uh, amount of knowledge that is available in Bhagavatam. Bhagavatam expands himself unlimitedly because Bhagavatam is Krishna himself. But Krishna manifests himself and in literary form as Srimad Bhagavatam, as was described in the first canto, when it was it was questioned, now, now that Krishna has left the planet, where is religious principles to be found? So this is just at the end of the Duparva Yuga when Krishna has now disappeared. He's performed his pastimes and now he's left. And so the question comes by the sages, where do we find Krishna now? And the answer is in Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the literary incarnation of Krishna. And therefore, his name, fame, form, qualities, pastimes, entourage, his pure devotees, and the different aspects of the Lord's relationship with the living entities in different categories are all described nicely in Srimad Bhagavatam. One should make a, a, a study of Bhagavatam. And there are many, many books that correlate Bhagavatam from different angles of vision. His Holiness uh, Krishna Shaitan Maharaj has done two volumes, quite big, at least 300 pages, called Voyaging Through the Bhagavatam, Part 1 and Part 2. And he takes different aspects of the Bhagavatam, breaks it down. There's even discussions on the different uh, incarnations of the Lord from philosophical angles of vision. It's interesting. Uh, if we make Bhagavatam our life study, then as it says, you won't, all the knowledge you need and more, plus the realization that comes from that knowledge, is found within the, within the process of Srimad Bhagavatam. So second canto will really set the foundation for the essence of what Bhagavatam is all about. It's uh, really a powerful canto. Although it's a short canto, there's only 10, cha 10 chapters. It's the second shortest canto in the entire Bhagavatam. The only one that's shorter than that is the 12th canto. But in that 10 chapters, it, especially towards the end of the, it really glorifies Bhagavatam in so many ways. And we get an insight of what Bhagavatam is to offer. And that insight is self-realization and freedom from material. Uh, entanglement, which causes the living entity to suffer life after life after life with no end to the suffering until they finally wake up and take to the process of pure devotional service. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Marge, for such an in-depth class. I would request... Um sure to stop sharing and we can go to question and answer if anyone is able to turn their videos off please do so and uh, so that we can have each other's association if there are any questions please do raise your hand and we will call you in the order that the hands are raised um march i have a question and it's um as one of the lines that your prophet has mentioned in the purport that he said that unless one takes up the service attitude then even the virat realization will have little effect 
on the person. Then why have in the first place, Marge? I'm just trying to understand. If there's a little effect, then will they ever get to the stage or why? If they do a little bit of service, in other words, if they if they have a complete exploitative nature and don't do any service, this will, will this description will become bewildering and they'll still never benefit or understand for what is being given. Even if they have a little element of devotional service, that's enough for them to enter into the understanding of Krishna in the form of the Virat Rupa. It doesn't say that they have to become pure devotees, nor does it indicate that either. It says that they have to take up a little bit of the devotion service to some degree. And in other words, if they just hear about Krishna or they do a little practical service to serve the devotees in some form or another, even if it's not done in a regular way, still there is benefit. And that way, that, that qualifies them to understand a little bit about the Virat uh, Rupa form. Because it is an imaginary form. It's not real. But it's there for the, the materialists so they can see they can see Krishna in the form of the material energy. Mm -hmm. And Marsh, because the, the 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 Virat form is imaginary, I it this question just popped into my mind. Do the materialists know that it's imaginary or do they accept it as it is? Well, <clears throat> um they accept it in the sense that in that imagination there is there is reality. The form is imagination is imaginary, but the different elements within the uh, form, in other words, the different ingredients that make up the universal form, are actually real. The planets are real, and all of the ingredients that make up the planetary systems are also factual. So in that sense, they they get some benefit. Oh, well, if, if I see a mountain, it reminds me of the bones of the Lord. If I see a forest, that's the hairs on his body. So they can imagine the form and reflect the, the ingredients, or they can see the ingredients and think in terms of God's form in, based on those ingredients. Yeah. The rivers are, are his abdomen, like that. You'll go into the details as you go through the these chapters. March is going to be a pretty technical chapter. <laughs> it's going to be interesting. This journey is so depth. And I was just realizing how powerful the title of this chapter is the first step to God realization. It's, and it's so deep and so technical. It's pretty, pretty powerful. It gets one beyond the idea of exploitation, or it's meant to give the get one beyond the idea of exploitation, because as long as one is engaged in exploit exploiting the material energy, they can't understand um, the Lord in any aspect. It helps them. Oh, you know. Just like you see, the very prim primitive societies also may worship the earth in its different forms. So that's the first step in God realization. You know, we have the example of the Native American Indians in the United States who saw the different parts of the, the, the earth as different parts of God. And they considered the earth to be sacred. And their worship was of the earth and material energy. They didn't have a clear conception of God, although they de de deitized him and de through the material energy. Like that. So the, it's there that there is some there is benefit. Thank you, Marge. Wow. Pretty deep. Thank you. Any questions from devotees, please do raise your hand or you can put it in the chat and I'll be happy to read it. 
Actually, it's quite simple. <laughs> I think, yeah, March. It's it's that it's the mind <laughs> gets makes it so complicated. But yeah, and March, I was even you know thinking how merciful the Lord is to give His mercy through the smallest thing, like you're mentioning how the Native Indians, right, and I mean the Native Americans, sorry, they they uh, they worship the earth as sacred. And they still do get some benefit. It's just Krishna is so merciful. Yeah, sometimes devotees, we find devotees who are very much worshiping the Lord in the temple, but they misuse or abuse or waste or, or, or even exploit to some degree the material energy, not seeing the connection. Then we consider ourselves bhakta being, you need to connect both. You need to connect both. And just like if we're accepting exploitation in the form of material things that we need for living in this world, we're actually contributing to that consciousness that actually it's okay to exploit the earth because, uh, or else use the earth for our own interests because that's what it's here for. <laughs> mm. But it's not. That's why one has to perform perform jagya. If one performs jagya, then one can be freed from the the, the idea of exploitation. And the jagya in this age is the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Thank you, Marge. Manisha, please go with the question. Thank you so much, Mataji. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All the rest of the world. Maharaj, thank you so much for such an Octavian class. Maharaj, my question is related to the last class. How to earn Sukritis? How to what? How to earn Sukritis? How to earn Sukritis, Maharaj? Don't worry about earning Sukritis. Just chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> That's all you need to do. <laughs> It's the embodiment of all Sukriti right there. <laughs> okay, Maharaj. You, the process of devotional service is above all of these benefits that come by pious activities. Sukritis are benefits come, that come by pious activities. Devotional service is, includes pious activities, and, and it takes you above the material energy. And so if I'm going to give you a thousand, you know, thousand rupees, and you say, well, I just want one rupee. <laughs> well, why not take a thousand? Because then you'll have one rupee too, and you'll have more than that also. Mm. So we're not interested in material sukritis, <laughs> which are simply benefits from pious activities. Opening wells, feeding the poor, doing philanthropical work. These are all, these, all of these activities bring about a type of sukriti. So for a materialist, it's good. We encourage them to do these type of activities because it elevates their consciousness away from exploitation and towards a type of service attitude towards others. When they get the service attitude towards others, then, then gradually they can understand that beyond that, there is the source of everything. And the way to relate to the to source is in the same way as we relate to the living entities in its work through the process of service. Only by service. Krishna says, only by undivided devotional service can I be known as I am standing before you and thus be seen directly. Only in this way can you enter into the mysteries of my understanding. So these pious activities are elements of service that bring one to devotional service or at least qualify one to take up devotional service but they're not devotional service. So, 
Hope that helped, Manisha. Yeah, so just tell how to <laughs> You'll be okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you. Dr. Brett, you're next. Go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. I'll be with you, Maharaj. I'll be with you, Srila Prabhupada. I'm, I'm at work right now again, so I, I apologize for not putting my video on and if my audio sounds a bit laggy. Um, but Maharaj, on the topic of service for the Lord, there's something I've been thinking about lately, um, and it's trying to you know, differentiate and maintain a mood you know, of loving service for Krishna and Krishna's devotees um, while, while performing service. Sometimes personally, I find, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm serving out of sentimentality. And to use an example, you know, I may want to plant flowers for Krishna. So I might, you know, dig a hole and throw some flowers in and say, you know, Haribo, here, here are flowers I'm offering to Krishna. And then in, in one sense, Maharaj, I think to myself, you know, within my services, I should be a little bit more thoughtful about it. You know, I should turn the soil, I should fertilize the soil, I should clean the roots of the plant, then, then I, should, I should set the plant. And, but within that thought, Maharaj, this is where the question is, I'm, I'm struggling with, you know, when I'm thinking rigidly about my service and how I can please the devotees, am I becoming too familiar with Krishna? Am I, am I losing that sentimentality and that spontaneous love for Krishna and just thinking, you know, work, work, work? Um, so, Maharaj, I'm just asking for guidance. You know, how can I, how can I maintain that mood? I'm try I've, I've asked one shiksha and they, they said, you know, keep a, keep, you know, keep an at home deity and, and have an intimate, you know, personal relationship in the morning with the Lord. So just looking for your guidance, Maharaj. Sorry, well. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Patram Pushvam Falam Tayam Yomi Bhakta Panasyati Taraham Bhakta Uparitam Asnami Vayatat Manaha. Just offer me a leaf, a flower, fruit, and water, and with devotion, and I accept. So Krishna is showing that any service, if it's done with the desire to please Krishna, he'll accept it, and that's bhakti. So even if you're doing simple things like planting flowers, if you want to do it to offer the results of that activities to Krishna, that's bhakti. That's nice. And you can build on it from there. Where then, of course, that is service. But sadhana, as you explained in the last part of your, your, your statement, is the foundation where we develop the desire to to engage in service so we need to hear and chant and worship in the morning as the foundation by which we get established in our krishna consciousness krishna consciousness is like planting a seed in the ground but then the seed needs the ground needs to be fertile the seed needs to be you know a good seed the uh the watering process has to be there, and then sunlight. So all of these are part of bringing the seed into a plant. So hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord are, is uh, watering the seed, the seed of our, our bhakti creeper, which is planted by the association of the spiritual master who directs one in the right, in a way that one can make a progress. So sadhana, service, and the goal of service is sadhya, or yeah, the goal. So uh, just to do service without sadhana, well, keep, make service seem to be just like ordinary activity. When you hear and chant, you're purifying your consciousness and you're getting the understanding that the activities of devotional service are not material, but they're actually connected to Krishna through the through the guidance of the spiritual master. So in our temples, the first thing we do in the morning is we worship the spiritual master. You know, with the Guru Vastakam prayers, then we worship the pure devotee Tulsi Devi. Then we engage in chanting our rounds. Then we worship the pure devotee again in the Guru Vandanam prayers. Then we hear and chant the glories of the Lord through the knowledge given to us by Srimad Bhagavatam. 
So the morning program in the temple is very much a foundation for developing our consciousness in where when we engage in service, it becomes what we say uh, beneficial and not just routine work that we do because we have to do it. And we might know it's devotional service, but unless the heart develops some purity through the chanting of the holy name, we'll still remain on a neophyte platform and will not be able to understand the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. We have to hear and chant without understanding the philosophy. We can't clearly understand the nature of the practice either. So if if you're not living in the temple, then you should have sadhana wherever you are. You should do some little mangalarti, worship the deity, have an altar where you have pictures. If if you have, don't have deities, you have pictures. And you can also hear the lectures of the Srimad Bhagavatam from recorded lectures. Um, you can listen to the prayers chanted by the pure devotees, the Mangalarti prayers, the Tulsi prayers, the Guru Vandanam prayers. You can gather your family members and also do that together. So unless we have a morning program, there's no excuse. You can't, you, you can't, you won't, you won't make advancement in this process. There has to be morning program whether it's at home or in the temple. A temple is ideal because it's structured and so many are there to perform the activities in a more unified way. But you can do it at home also. The home can become a temple. And if you do that, you set the foundation for the rest of the day in the, in the service that you do. So... It, Living outside of the temple doesn't mean we don't do anything. <laughs> we have to use the morning hours for our sadhana. Sadhana is foundational. Without sadhana, it's like trying to build a building with no foundation. And if your sadhana is weak, the foundation is weak, and the building will also be of the same quality. It will also be weak. <laughs> Hope that helped, Dr. Brett. He's at work, so I'm sure he might post something. No, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank, thank you so much. I mean, this was something I was talking with a, a devotee friend of mine the other day, you know, just how grateful we should be to, you know, for the morning program, what Srila Prabhupada gave us. And this, this friend is an Indian devotee. So we were talking about, you know, the differences, you know, between Indian culture and American culture and what Srila Prabhupada really gave to all of us. And, and I must admit, Maharaj, and, and I, I won't take your words, you know, for granted. Um, you know, morning programs at home are so important for devotees and not something to take for granted. Absolutely. Um, but hopefully I will speak to you soon more about this, Maharaj. Um, if you would like, Maharaj, I was actually, uh, Chaitanya Chandra Das called me yesterday and asked if I would take you to New York City, Rafiatra. But of course, Maharaj, that's completely up to you. I right, will. <laughs> We'll, we'll talk about that. <laughs> Thank you, Marge. Ileana, you're next. Go ahead. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. He's the step to my humble obedience. He's all glories to Shri Prabhupada, all glories to all devotees. Um, um, I have a question about uh, uh, spiritual brotherhood and sisterhood. What say the Srila Prabhupada about this? You hearing me? No, no capish, no capish. <laughs> ah, okay. Uh, hearing well my voice. Huh? No capish. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, what what say the Srila Prabhupada about uh, uh, brotherhood and sisterhood in spiritual uh, path? I think much what she's asking is what did Sri Prabhupada say about brotherhood and sisterhood? Is that what it is, Eliana? Okay. Yes. 
brotherhood and sisterhood on the material platform is fleeting, ephemeral. It comes and it goes. In one life, you're a brother. In another life, you're a sister. In another life, you're, you're maybe a, maybe your brothers and sisters are dogs or cats or monkeys. So in different lives, you have different material arrangements for, for family members. So these are not the real. The real brothers and sisters are on the on the spiritual platform. We're all living entities. Krishna says, Mamai Bamso Jiva Loke Jiva Bhuta Sanatana. That all living entities are my parts and the parcels. They're in me and they're mine. So Krishna is the Supreme Father, the Hambija Padapida. He says that in the in the fourteenth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, I am the source of, I am the father of all living entities. I give life to all that lives. <laughs> so everything that is alive is spiritual. Everything that is material is not alive. It's just ephemeral, and it get, it's given life by spirit. So real brotherhood and sisterhood is on the spiritual platform. To see all living entities, vidya, 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 what is it? Vidya vinaya sampane, brahmani gavi hastini, suni chaiva svapake cha pandita, samadarshan. Samadarshan means to see equally. One who sees all living entities as spiritual beings, no matter what bodily covering they may have, is actually seeing. So in that way, God is the father and we are all his children. That is real. That is the actual understanding of brotherhood, sisterhood like that. Thank you so much. Yeah, this this family stuff is there temporarily. We we define it in the same way, but ultimately it ha it loses its uh, reality as time goes on. It's not yes. something my, that my... According, to, according to Shastra, something that is not eternal is not real. And something that is uh, eternal is real. So if something is true at a certain time and not true at another time, what is it? Is it true or not true? You can't say it's true because at one point it becomes not true. But something that is always true is real. Therefore, on the spiritual platform, all living entities are brothers and sisters. And God is the common father. <laughs> and material energy is the, is the provider for the living entities in the material world under the guidance of the Supreme Father. Mm -hmm. Hope that helped, Elena, Eliana. That's why we call yeah. Earth. We call Earth Mother. Also, mm -hmm. <laughs> she's yeah. Mother Earth, and that's not just an, a euphemism, just to say something. Earth is actually the mother, because everything you need to live is supplied by the Earth. And God is the supreme uh, provider. He says the material energy works under my direction. So, <clears throat> so he, he supplies the earth with everything that's needed. And the earth provides or doesn't provide according to the activities of the... So just like in the family, if the children are good, they get the benefit of the parents. If they yeah. disobey the parents, then they are punished and are restricted because of their disobedience. So mother is there, but she can she gives and she restricts. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you for the question, Thank Ileana. You. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Amrita Nam, you're next. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. My humble obeisances, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. So um Thank you for this uh, wonderful explanation of the universal form. Um, I was just thinking that um, oh, when we 
this universal form is actually for the non devotees to it's an imaginary form so um how do we how do the non devotees come to the point of sacrifice relating to the um universal form because a uh, sacrifice is what uh, they have to do uh, while staying in the material world and, and this material form is uh, so this universal form universal form is also actually the um in one sense it is for the material um uh, world only yeah to get them the opportunity to use the material energy for the benefit of others rather than to exploit the material energy that's the first step in other words to raise them to the mode of goodness <laughs> Goodness is not bhakti, but it is the stage before bhakti. <laughs> Rather than so what, I am able, um, uh, what I am unable to understand is how does this universal form raise uh, to to that? Well, when you goodness. see, it's almost like pantheism. Did you come across that word in previous verses yet? How it's described as pantheism. Yes, Marsh, they came across that. Pantheism, pantheism says that everything is God. But we say everything is God and not God simultaneously. It's the energy of God, but not God. But if they see it as God, then they they the tendency will be not to exploit it. Mm -hmm. but to use it for the purpose that it's meant to be used. Even from the material perspective. The idea is to get people to the mode of goodness. And when, as long as mode of passion and ignorance, ignorance is complete destruction with no intelligence. No, they can't benefit themselves. They can't benefit others. They have no intelligence at all. They're more like animals, mode of, mode of ignorance. Mode of ignorance is, is, mode of passion is a little better, but they see the material energy as an opportunity to be used for their own enjoyment. And they, they exploit the material energy and use it in different ways to find some happiness by getting, making money, getting a good family and, doing all kinds of nice material things in order to enjoy in that way. But the motivation is enjoyment, not service. The mode of goodness is to take the elements that the Lord has given and use it for the benefit of others and for the benefit of oneself, not in an exploitative way, but in a way that it, these elements are meant to be used like that. So, Walking through a forest, a person in a mode of ignorance will, you know, take their potato chip bag and throw it on the ground and keep walking. <laughs> but a person in a mode of passion might think, uh, I'll, you know, I'll, uh, I won't throw it on the ground. I'll just pick it up and I'll look for a place to throw it that is not going to litter the earth. <clears throat> The person in the mode of goodness will see that everything in in the earth is actually an energy of God and should not be misused or abused in any way. But still they don't have they don't know how to use it, at least for elevation to the spiritual realm. But they are in a position to move to that spiritual realm. Therefore, when they come in contact with devotees or the spiritual master, it's like it's like the, the example is given. When the wood is wet, it doesn't ignite. So in other words, people in the mode of passion, even if they are people in the mode of ignorance, even if they come in contact with a pure devotee, they can't recognize the pure devotee, nor can they even see the benefit of it. They may even find 
They may even find fault. Person in a mode of passion will see that this person is, you know, a spiritual person, but that's not for me. I'm more interested in, uh, you know, and getting some material gain in my life. A person in a mode of goodness will see, oh, the spiritual master, actually, here's a chance to uh, uh, understand more about spiritual life. So the wood is wet, the wood is partially wet, or the wood is completely dry. When the flame hits each one of them, it has a different effect upon the wood. <laughs> Sometimes it's used that when fire falls on water, it goes out. When fire falls on uh, some land, uh, some, uh, what we say, rocks or something, it'll burn for a while and then eventually go out. When fire falls on some dry grass, it'll ignite, it'll ignite, the, ignite the grass and burn more. These are the different modes. Mm -hmm. So this, this universal form is to bring people to the mode of goodness. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. I think uh, I got the answer. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Very nice question, Amritanam. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions from devotees? Thank you, Maharaj. Please accept my whole obeisances. All glories to you. All glories to the Prabhupada. All glories to the devotees. Um, when you were speaking, you talked about the material universes, um, and you made a nice connection, because I was going to ask this question, but you've already explained part of it. So I'm just going to bring what I understood so you to confirm or correct as, as it may be. Shema Bhavatam Canto 1, Chapter 1, Text 1. In the, in the, um, the translation, it says, it's only because of him do the material universes temporarily manifested by the reactions of the three modes of nature appear factual. And then it says, although they are unreal. And so every time I see that, and I'm told, oh, but it is fact. They come out, the material universes are there at the point, and they're not, they're not there, but they're fact. But you explained that um, how can you take it as fact? When something is fact, then it, it's present the whole time, and that is the spiritual world. And the material world is sometimes there, sometimes not there, and therefore we and put it in that other category. Yeah, it's describing the difference between eternal and temporary. Okay. And so what is temporary is considered to be unreal. And if you want to break that same definition down into um, what are the different forms of the wor in this world? They're a combination of earth, water, fire, air, and ether. They're the mm -hmm. basic ingredients that make up the forms. So you, you can, you'll see that actually what you see as a form is just a combination of these different elements. That's all. Mm -hmm. there okay. are people who, there are people who know know how to con manipulate material energy for instance there are people who can take their hand and put it through the wall and let it come out the other side because they know that the wall is made of a combination of certain material elements and so with mind over matter they can uh use the power of the mind to go beyond the structure of matter. People can walk on hot coals and not have their feet get burnt. <laughs> People can fly through the air too. So you see that the way you see it is, is just one way to see it. And that's just one form of illusion. You can see it in so many different ways. But ultimately, mm -hmm. it's because it's temporary, it changes. And because it's changing, it's never considered to be real. Right? Mm -hmm. A person will see something one day, and then the next day it changes, and then they'll have a different attitude towards it 
after the change. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> it's, just, it's just like <laughs> I can think of some really what we said, mm -hmm. some base analogies, you know. <laughs> but it's simply my, my my New York attitude, so I don't know if I should. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a guy gets married to a, his wife, and then the first time he sees her without makeup, he says, who are you? Oh, I'm your wife. Really? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way. <laughs> mm. No offense, no offense to anybody that uses makeup, but it makes the point very clearly. <laughs> When they wake up in the morning, oh my God, who are you? <laughs> Don't you recognize me? No. <laughs> mm -hmm. So in material life is just different levels of illusion. But because it's always changing, ultimately it disappears and creates another form of illusion after it transforms into from one form to another. That's so. all. Mm. You the point is, the point is the <laughs> company cannot be satisfied with something temporary because we are eternal. That's the thing. Because our mm. nature is eternal, we have we cannot find something that is contrary to our nature and find satisfaction in that. Mm. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sakshi Prabhu, go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Sorry about the analogy. <laughs> it's a good analogy, Maharaj. <laughs> I couldn't think of it. <laughs> go ahead, Sakshi. Thank you, Mantaji. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, Maharaj, you were uh, talking about uh, devotional service, like the devotees they who practice devotional service, but at the same time they exploit the material nature and material things. So I wanted to have a little clarification on the same. Can you help me with an example? Yeah. Yeah, we use, sometimes we use we use uh, paper plates in our and we're we're just we're taking you know paper and th throwing it away we're using styrofoam which is polluting we uh we still accept milk from cows that are going to be slaughtered and therefore we're buying into the slaughter industry there's so many things the devotees sometimes, you know, this is the criticism that the, the non-devotees give us sometimes. You know, the way we waste material energy. Devotees sometimes turn on the faucet and leave it running. You should never leave the faucet running. When you're brushing your teeth, you turn it on, shut it off, turn it on when you need it, don't leave it running. Leaving water running, leaving lights on when there's not, leaving fans on when there's nobody in the room. We waste energy. Prabhupada was really strong about that. And my god sister, when I was in Ujjain, she was there, Daivi Shakti, she was telling us that Prabhupada was coming into his room. And so the devotees cleaned the room real nice and they turned on the lights and the fan before Prabhupada got in the room. And Prabhupada walked into the room. He said, what is this? You're wasting Krishna's energy. They did it to greet Prabhupada with a lighted room and a fan. But Prabhupada wasn't, he wasn't impressed by that. He said, you're wasting energy. So we waste material energy. We spend money on different things we don't need. <laughs> That's another form of waste. 
we take we we sometimes we take food we have leftovers and we throw it rather than giving it to other living entities to So well, yeah, devotees also, you know, are very, can be very wasteful. That's a form of exploitation. There's, there's an old saying in America, waste not, want not. If you never waste, waste not, want not. If you don't waste, you'll, you'll always have whatever you need. But if you waste things after some time, Nature or God may restrict you from getting there those 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 products because of waste. It means we don't appreciate it and waste it. Leaving lights on in the rooms were not even there. <laughs> well, but strong about that. Turn the lights off. <laughs> well, but would be on a morning walk. And there would be a faucet dripping from a person's house, you know, these outside faucets. And it'd be, and then Prabhupada would tell one of his devotees, go over there and shut the faucet off. They're wasting Krishna's energy. <laughs> See, a, 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 the devotee has pure consciousness. He sees everything relationship to Krishna. Therefore, he doesn't waste anything or misuse anything because he knows it's all it's all connected to Krishna. It belongs to Krishna. One of the things that we do when we could walk somewhere, we jump in the car, and we drive for two minutes to get to a store where we could just walk. <laughs> Prabhupada criticized us for that. We're so lazy that we have to use a car just to go down the street <laughs> sometimes. Wasting gas. So yeah, if you be conscious of this, there's the, the non-devotees are more conscious of these things than we are. And that's that's a fact. And they even criticize us for that too. We get we got we get feedback from the non devotees sometimes when they come to our temples and see how we wasting during the Sunday feast. That's when I think Marge we get the most criticism is on Sunday feast. <laughs> they say you should take just as much as you're gonna eat on your plate. Always take a little less. You can always get more, but if you pull up your fill up your plate and you don't finish it then you wind up throwing it <laughs> what devotees used to do in the old days when when there was leftovers after the sunday feast they would they would take it and eat it so as not to waste it mm. thank you maraj such a uh practical thoughts that we all have to apply to simple practical applications on a daily basis. Yeah, be conscious that everything is conscious. conscious. Yeah. Especially leaving water running. That's that's what we're expert at that. You can take a shower in two minutes and you can take a shower in 15 minutes. <laughs> Lord Govinda Maharaj used to say, you know, a shower should take you 30 seconds. <laughs> so, in other words, you sprinkle a little water on, you shut off the you shut off the water, and then you soap yourself down and you rinse off and you're done. <laughs> Don't wait. If you if you have that consciousness, you'll see how to save Krishna's energy. And if you do that, you'll never be in want of any time. Mm -hmm. 
what I really don't like, I get agitated. Devotees take paper towels and clean everything with paper towels. They don't have a instead of a rag, they get pay, they get a big roll of paper towels, take half the roll off, and clean the floor with it. <laughs> so that's trees, that's paper that comes from the earth. I always tell them you have a rag for cleaning the floor and not just take paper towels and clean everything with it. And half the time the paper towels don't don't even do its job, Maharaj. The cloth is the rag is the best. <laughs> yeah, keep a rag and then squeeze it out and you have it there all the time and can be used like that. Another thing that devotees do is that when they wash the floor, when the floor when they're done washing it, it's still dirty. <laughs> they get this stand-up mop and they push it from side to side, squeeze it out, and then when it dries, the floor has still got dirt on the floor because all they did was move the dirt from one side to another. <laughs> they get half of it up and the other half is still on the floor. I'll show you how to wash floors when I come to Harrisburg. Prabhupada taught us. He he did it personally himself. Girirad Swami includes one little antidote where Prabhupada taught one of his female disciples how to wash a floor. Marsh would love to learn from you, Marsh. Please. I can tell you. You get two buckets. One with water with a little bit of soap in it, and the other one with just plain water. You dip your water, rag in the water with soap. You get down on your hands and knees, no no apparatus, just the rag. And you wash a portion of the floor. Then you squeeze the rag out, put it back in the other bucket, and then you dry it. And then you go on to the next section. So when you're done, the floor is clean and dried. You don't have to turn the fan on for two hours to get the floor dry as they do in India all the time. <laughs> so yeah, these are, you might consider them to be little things, but why did Prabhupada give so much importance to these things? Because he understood everything is Krishna's energy. Don't waste. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so much for this practical, important points of cleanliness, actually, and consciousness, and being conscientious. Yes, thank you, Maharaj. <coughs> Baraji Prabhu, go ahead. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Our glory is to Srila Prabhupada, Noranga, and uh, Sambal devotees. Maharaj, um, in today's class, you mentioned that um, uh, non devotees look at uh, the Virat Swarupa and then which is like an imaginary form. Whereas in uh, Bhagavad Gita, uh, Lord manifests and uh, shows his Virat Swarupa to uh, Arjuna. So that's a different form from this one, or uh, how do we understand, Maharaj? Yeah, that's different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's different. And that form is, is different. It's also called the universal form. But in there, all of the uh, all of the uh, well, you might say the pleasant things of material nature are exhibited in all of the horrible things. You see the form. You see faces spitting fire and then you see smiling and beautiful faces. So that particular form shows that everything in material energy is actually ultimately an expansion of Krishna. Right, Maharaj. Yeah, it's different. What he showed to Arjun, what Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu showed to uh, Advaita Charya, these are different. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you for the question and clarification, Balji Prabhu. Thank you. Any other questions from devotees? 
that you would like to ask? To ask. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. This is my audience. Glory to Srila Prabhupada. I would like to ask you, um, when somebody is doing a, a preaching with people not devotees, and this preaching bring also to build some to build some friendship with these people. How can you do to not be cold with these people, but also protect yourself? That requires intelligence. <laughs> okay. That requires some intelligence. And some with some experience also. Learn the art of uh, learn just like they say. If you're fishing, you have to catch the fish without falling into the water. <laughs> That's just an example. So you have to be able to preach and at the same time not be affected by them. That requires intelligence, requires some experience also. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question too, Akila. <laughs> Are there any other questions from devotees that you would like to ask? Going down the list so that I don't miss anyone. And if there isn't, Maharaj, would you like to end with a round of chanting? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <You're> here. <laughs>